beautiful music can soothe the soul, bring a smile to your face, or even a tear to your eye, CBS's Steve Hartman has the story of a young musician that will do all three in tonight's On the Road. To 11-year-old Jude Kofi of Aurora, Colorado, this surprise was music to his eyes. Obviously, whoever said the best things come in small packages was never gifted a grand piano. Jude's father, Isaiah. So one day it just shows up at the house? Yes, all for free. Who does that? The answer in a moment. But first, the reason. About a year and a half ago, Jude's dad heard a noise coming from the basement. There was an old keyboard down there, but no one knew how to play it. Certainly not his autistic son, Jude. Or so he thought. Isaiah then got Jude a larger keyboard to see what more he could do. And boy, could he do. The kid never had a lesson. No one taught him any of this. How do you explain that you're as good as you are? It's a miracle. You think it's a miracle? That's what I prefer. Bill Magnuson prefers that too. Is he special? He's beyond special. He's Mozart level. It's coming from somewhere beyond. Bill is a piano tuner. He saw a local news story about Jude, heard him play, learned how his parents immigrated from Ghana, how they're raising four children and sending money back to Ghana. What resources are left over to help this special little soul? <laughs> Yours. Yeah. Using an inheritance from his father, Bill bought the piano, spent $15,000. He has promised to tune it once a month for the rest of his life. Very nice. And he's even paying for Jude to get professional lessons. We're family now. Somebody to just love your son like that by making sure that his future is secured. We are super thankful. Yeah. Press the pedal. Caring for other children as your own. The defining note of humanity. Steve Hartman, on the road in Aurora, Colorado. There are few things in this world more powerful than a child with a dream. And in this week's On the Road, CBS's Steve Hartman shows us how a group of Minnesota school kids used their dream to help their fellow classmates. At Glen Lake Elementary in Hopkins, Minnesota, recess is a mixed blessing. On the one hand, there's so much to do. But on the other hand, not everyone can do it. It just didn't seem fair that some kids were just left out. And it's really sad to see other kids go through that. They didn't look happy, and recess is about having fun. Glen Lake has a lot of students with physical disabilities, but no wheelchair merry-go-round, swings, or any adaptive playground equipment whatsoever. Come on in. Which really bothered the kids in Betsy Julian's fifth grade class, to the point where one day they asked her, why can't we just buy the equipment ourselves? I said, do you know how much that costs? Yeah. It costs a lot of money. $300,000. $300,000 by her estimation. But the kids were undeterred. They started collecting spare change, then held a bake sale, printed flyers, and went door to door. Then they began cold calling businesses and even got restaurants to donate a portion of their profits. This went on for months until last week when they hit their goal. We were all very happy on the inside and on the outside. The smile on my face, I could say, was an ear-to-ear -ear smile. I was just really happy that we made it. Reese Riley says they work so hard. It was overwhelming to finally know a more inclusive playground would be coming. You're a good kid. Thanks. And as for the kids who will benefit, they seem to appreciate the effort almost more than the result. First time I set foot on this playground, I'm probably gonna start crying. From seeing the effort that all the school has made. Mrs. Julian couldn't agree more. My future as an adult is bright knowing that this generation of students, of change makers,
see something that needs fixing, and they go for it head first. The whole thing. Head first and dive deep. What's our next step? After raising the 300000 Mrs. Julian's class set a new goal, to the ceiling and beyond. They now hope to buy adaptive playground equipment for other schools in the district, turning loneliness and isolation into child's play. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Hopkins, Minnesota. Thank you. Finally tonight, a lesson in never giving up, even when it seems the odds are stacked against you. Need proof? CBS's Steve Hartman found it on the road. Technically, 13-year-old Josiah Johnson of Louisville, Kentucky has a disability. But almost no one sees it because Josiah doesn't see it. Although born without legs, the kid has yet to find his kryptonite. Always did everything the other kids did. But that invincibility was put to the test last fall when Josiah decided to try out for the one sport where altitude is everything, the Moore Middle School basketball team. At this point, you may be wondering, why didn't he just join a wheelchair basketball team? It would certainly be a lot easier. Well, Josiah says, exactly. It was easy, it was too easy. You wanted more of a challenge? Yeah. The gumption it takes to be able to say, I'm gonna go out and do that. Who has that kind of confidence? Me. <laughs> <laughs> but as Mother Whitney says, it's not just confidence, it's stubbornness. Josiah is very competitive, and if he feels like something is too easy, he's not gonna do it. Still, Josiah knew making the team was a long shot. Fortunately though, Josiah turned out to be pretty good at long shots. He made the team on his merits. And over the last few months has become a real contributor, getting offensive rebounds, assists, and because of his unique position on the floor, he has caused more than a few turnovers. He started taking the ball from people. He took the ball from me. I was mad. You would have thought Steph Curry was in the gym. But his teammates say his best play was a couple weeks ago. It was just a moment that I'm going to remember for like ever. It was the end of the game, seconds remaining. Josiah shoots from three. And again, his disability disappeared. What do you want people to take away from this? To do something that they thought they couldn't do. Josiah Johnson, inspiration and proof that all you need to stand above is confidence. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Louisville, Kentucky. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to revisit a touching story of true love that blossomed in sickness and in health. Oh my gosh, let's find the picture. Peter and Lisa Marshall of Andover, Connecticut are paging through the most memorable day of their lives. It was unforgettable. But he's forgotten it. He has forgotten it. Who's this? It's the saddest part mm. because you want to reminisce and you're alone in the memory. Red Wing Blackbird. As we first reported a couple years ago, Peter was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Eventually, he not only forgot his wedding day. He's pretty, isn't he? He forgot his wife. Lisa became just another nameless caretaker. And yet, a whisper of their love must have remained, because Lisa says all of a sudden, he began courting her, as if they'd just started dating. Until one day, a wedding scene came on TV. Peter pointed to the screen and said, let's do it. And I said, do what? And he pointed at the, he pointed again. And I said, you wanna get married? And he got this grin on his face, and he said, yeah. So he fell in love with me again. <laughs> Lisa accepted his proposal and staged a wedding for her already husband. I can't even describe to you how magical it was. He was so present and it was very touching. Peter, you may kiss your bride. Lisa says Peter hadn't been this lucid in weeks, <laughs> but it was a Cinderella moment. The clock struck 12 and by the next morning, this wedding too was lost to the fog. Yes. But Lisa says she fully expected that. 
I'm the one who's going to remember that, and that's going to help me heal later. Unfortunately, later came. Peter died about a year ago. Lisa is now advocating for other Alzheimer's patients and their families. She has also written a book called, Oh, Hello, Alzheimer's. I wanted people to understand the devastation of the disease. But mostly I want people to continue to find joy and really focus on, the, on being present with their loved ones. Do that, and Lisa says Alzheimer's will never defeat you. It'll just make your love all the more invincible. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Andover, Connecticut. Finally tonight, with all the anger and hate we see in the world today, it is nice to remember that there are still some people out there with a good heart. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. If you need your faith in humanity restored, the pharmacy in Geraldine, Alabama has just the medicine. A story of kindness that began 10 years ago when a man walked in and asked to speak with pharmacist Brooke Walker. So I assumed that he needed counseled on a medication. And that's when he said, you know, do you ever have anybody that can't pay for their medicine? Brooke said, all the time. And he said, next time that happens, I want you to use this. He handed her a hundred dollar bill, the first of many hundred dollar bills he would donate anonymously to help those in Geraldine who can't afford their prescriptions. People like Bree Slogater. To be honest, I was desperate. I was like, what am I going to do? I was defeated. And she said, it's taken care of. And I said, how? No one in Geraldine knew how. No one knew who. Until a few weeks ago, when the donor died and the story came out. His name? Hody Childress, an Air Force veteran and farmer. These are his children, Doug and Tanya. So when you heard of this secret, were you surprised? No. He was not a wealthy man, but he was probably the richest man on earth with his heart. Yes. He would say he's building up his riches for eternity, not for here. In fact, they say Hody was near broke after spending more than $10,000 on other people's prescriptions. The high cost of prescription drugs is a problem that extends well beyond rural Alabama, and a humble farmer can only do so much to fix it. But, as is often the case with kindness, sometimes a small deed can start a monumental movement. Are you aware of what's going on? Oh, we're aware, it's global. It's just blown our mind. That one small act makes a difference. Proof of that now shows up every day in the pharmacy mailbox. Folks either donating to keep the fund going in Geraldine or pledging to start a fund at their pharmacy. Doug and Tanya say that generosity doesn't take away their pain. Sure do miss it, Dad. But it does give it purpose. You made a big impression on people. Steve Hartman, on the road in Geraldine, Alabama. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman brings us a story about how forgiveness can lead to redemption on the road. The man in the green hoodie is Harrisburg, Pennsylvania City Councilman Ralph Rodriguez, trying to scare away a would-be burglar. He was at this window. Literally at the window. I saw him prying into here. The guy was trying to break into the office of a nonprofit Rodriguez runs. He just kind of took off. Just kept running Just kept way. going, yep. All the perpetrator left behind was this grainy image on a doorbell camera. So he could have gotten away with it if only he hadn't reached out to Rodriguez on social media, offering his name and his confession. I have to be willing to face the consequences, and that is what I'm ready to do. For most crime victims, that would be case closed. But for Ralph Rodriguez, it was opportunity opened. He didn't want to add another young man to the prison rolls, especially one with no prior criminal record. So instead of pressing charges, he pressed for answers. So you decide to meet this guy? Absolutely. And I actually took the time to hear his story, see the environment in which he lives in, and I get it. Poverty has a way of pushing you to do things that you would have never imagined you were even capable of doing. 22-year-old Rashawn Turner agreed to talk with us on condition we not show his face. 
I made a severe lapse in my judgment that night. My father was struggling with basic needs and I was like, I can't sit here and just wait for what little we still have to be taken away. I have to do something. And when Ralph Rodriguez heard that, he did something making sure he's financially good and has just some clothes on his back. So you started sending him money? Absolutely. The guy who just tried to rob Absolutely. you? Absolutely, yep. Because what he doesn't need anymore is any more disappointments. I'm pretty sure people have told him things in his life and dropped the ball 10 out of 10 times. It's just not what I'm prepared to do. And that's what you're bringing. Look, so yeah. Rodriguez turned the other yep. cheek. See how close we got to that? Gave him part-time work painting the very place he just tried to burglarize and set him up with job training. See that? I thought that there would be no one willing to help me, but you never know, you just have to ask. But I wasn't willing to ask. What are you gonna do with this chance? Not waste it. Let me look up this permit test. Ralph Rodriguez, the best kind of crime fighter. You just need a shot. Steve Hartman. Yeah, I'd be remiss if I didn't try my best to get you that shot, man. On the road in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a high school football star who's using lessons from his painful past to give others a brighter future. When Lincoln East High School football phenom, wide receiver Malachi Coleman announced he'd be playing for Nebraska next season, it was the completion of the ultimate Hail Mary. 12 years earlier, Malachi's mother left him and his younger sister by the side of the road and never returned. Malachi suffered abuse in the foster system until eventually he and his sister were adopted by a loving family. But so much damage had been done. He was a broken kid. Parents, Miranda and Craig Coleman. Like he lived for today and only today and nothing mattered. A mean and selfish jerk by his own admission who refused to do anything kind for anybody. Yeah, because nobody had really helped me up to that point, you know. So why should you help them? Yeah. So when the Nebraska School Activities Association ruled that high school athletes could now profit off their name and likeness, it came as no surprise that Malachi was first in line. The shocker was how he planned to spend it. Never could have predicted. No, it was his idea. They say Malachi walked into this local restaurant and offered to promote a burrito on condition a portion of the profits go to one cause. Put it towards um, advocating for the foster care system. Nick Maestas is the owner. How would you not want to be on board with that? This kid's remarkable transformation actually began a few years earlier after an hour long argument in which Miranda insisted he do something selfless. Uh, yeah, I threw out at least 100 ideas of things he could do. And exasperated, I finally said, what about holding a door? Can you hold one door for one person? And he finally was just like, I can hold a door. The next day at school, he held a door, then another and another. At church, he held the door for the entire congregation. Till now, he says kindness is his passion. I'm his daily. So you're saying all this charity stemmed from you holding a door for someone? Yes, because once I realized how good it makes me feel to help other people, it's just something that I knew that I wanted to continue in my life. Hopefully opening many more of the most important doors, the ones leading to a forever family. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Finally tonight, an Army widow makes good on a long-kept promise. CBS's Steve Hartman has her inspiring story on the road. It's karaoke night inside the Sigma Kappa sorority house at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. And here, amongst all the dancing queens in their teens, we found one stationary sister in her 40s. Tiffany Eckert, America's most unlikely sorority sister, in so many more ways than one. I still miss you every day. Tiffany's husband, Andy Eckert, died in the Iraq War. This is his wedding ring. Years later, I did a story on their son, Miles, the little boy who found a $20 bill in a Cracker Barrel parking lot 
and then gave it away to an airman he saw in the restaurant. Because he was a soldier, and soldiers remind me of my dad. Miles' tribute to his father deeply touched the nation. But there was another story here, one that has gone untold till now. Yeah. Just a few hours before my husband was killed, he called home from Iraq and he said, no matter how long it took, I had to get an education and he made me promise that I would. And then he told me, I love you more than anything in this world. I'll call you tomorrow. It was the last promise she ever made to him and the only one she hadn't kept. Tiffany says she barely made it through high school and now had little kids to raise on her own. College was out of the question. But those kids grew up. So three years ago, she decided to not only enroll, but to immerse herself in the full college experience. You can't focus on the negative because you'll always be in the pit. It's easier to claw your way up when you're reaching for the sunshine. That's how you get out of the hole. You know, she's helped me so much and she's inspired me a lot. And I know she's inspired a lot of the other girls in the chapter. There's definitely not one person she hasn't made an impact on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Including, Tiffany hopes, the most important person. I go back to that last phone call. And uh, I think he's really, really proud of me. She graduates next month. Love you. Promise kept. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Bowling Green, Ohio. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to revisit a story about finding beauty even in the most difficult of circumstances. So now what I have to do is use a ratio and proportion. To hear him talk, you'd think Detroit artist Richard Phillips was some kind of highly trained master. Into an abstract. But as we first reported in 2019, this was his first exhibit. And his son. I'm sorry, can you believe we're even having this conversation? <laughs> no, I can't believe it. He is America's most unlikely art phenom. I'm just a young kid from the ghettos that's been through hell and high water and still here. Before becoming celebrated, Richard was incarcerated. In 1971, he was arrested for murder, a murder we now know he didn't commit. To pass the time and temper the injustice, he painted. There was something to do, occupy my mind. Better than putting X's on a calendar. Right. I could get off into one of my paintings and just be in there for hours and hours and hours. And that's how it was for 46 years until he was exonerated in 2018. Unfortunately, after all that, the state just sent him on his way without so much as a bus ticket. How were you going to survive? I really didn't know. I thought maybe that I was going to have to stand out somewhere with a cup and beg for nickels and dimes. But then Richard thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe there was a way for him to make a living using his life's work. Wow. Hundreds and hundreds of watercolors. I could take my artwork and still make it in this world. And that he did. I just dreamed a lot. It's been four years since we first told this story. And thanks to his artwork sales, Richard now has a new house, new car, and for the first time in his life, a dog. It's not done yet. I'm still involved in social reform. I'm still involved in criminal injustice. I'm still involved with uh, the Innocence Network, so I'm just trying to stay active. Stay active and finally enjoy what was denied him all those 46 years, the American dream. If you own one of these, you own a piece of history. <laughs> I have to get that in there because that's very important. <laughs> Steve Hartman. You found yourself a career. <laughs> on the road in Detroit. Uh, being able to pitch. <laughs> being able to pitch, exactly. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to catch up with the basketball referee and the player who made the greatest assist of his life. Not many people get to return to the scene of their death. But as we first reported last summer, John Scully of Rochester, New York, stepped back into the gym where his time expired. That's the last thing I saw right there, 246. Do you recognize this at all? John oh, is a yeah. basketball referee. <laughs> they cut it, right? 
That's my jersey. Back in June, John was officiating a semi-pro game between the Jamestown Jackals and Toledo Glass City. That's him on the near side, seconds before his heart attack. The deadliest kind of heart attack, called a widow maker. Doctors told John's fiance, Donna, almost no one survives it. Yeah, 1% of the population, and he's that 1%. I was in the right place at the right time. I mean, that's why I'm here. Within seconds, a Toledo player named Miles Copeland rushed to his side and started doing CPR. I've never witnessed uh, someone just collapse, but uh, I knew what had to be done. Turns out the Toledo forward is also a Toledo firefighter, a brand new one. At the time, just a year out of the academy. What does that feel like when all is said and done and you've saved a life? It's honestly one of the best feelings in the world. Few moments will ever come close, except maybe. Oh my God. This one. We invited Miles to stop by the gym. It was their first meeting. I love you, man. You know I love you. <laughs> After quadruple bypass surgery, John said he was feeling much better and hoped to get back on the court someday. Well, it's been eight months since we first told this story. And number 110 is back in business. He has refed almost 50 games so far this season and appears none the worse for wear. All thanks to Miles Copeland, Love you too, man. <laughs> who made the ultimate Cinderella story so come sorry. true. <laughs> Steve Hartman, on the road, in Jamestown, New York. Now, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a group of teens who got some unexpected friend requests after offering support to local seniors. The residents at Brookdale Senior Living have a wealth of wisdom, but many also have a gap in that knowledge. Most notably, Look at all these different things. How do you work this telephone gizmo? Even turn it on. That was hard. Right. My email was not coming in. I don't know where things are. It's just not easy. Help. Tell me how to run it. <laughs> Enter our heroes. A group of computer savvy Gen Zers who march in once a week to control S the day. But why? A couple years ago, some students here at Canterbury School in Fort Myers, Florida, were joking about how bad their grandparents were at anything technical. But when the laughter faded, one of them was struck with a seriously good idea. Yeah, it's called CLEO. It stands for Computer Literacy Education Outreach. Aaron Smolyar, along with friends Christian Lakeese and Derek Hunican, started the CLEO Club and tried to partner with Brookdale. Yeah, initially we tried emailing, but I think maybe we got like put in the spam <laughs> you know how to use email? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So we, I mean, it's right next door. We literally, it was before we could drive, so we just walked over after school. And they've been volunteering ever since. Okay, then go to Photos icon. Jonathan Smith couldn't figure out how to text a picture. Do I poke it? Yeah, you just click it. And that's all there is to it? Yeah, click it. Nancy Kilpatrick wanted to clear out her inbox for the first time. 122,000. Emails? Yes. Fortunately, Nancy learned you don't have to delete them one at a time. Look at that. Look at that. What you, look at that. Oh. For the kids, it's not always easy. I'm getting it. All right. But they keep coming back, week after week. I've never had that before. Those young people are just amazing. A great group. They're a blessing, you know. And they have so much patience with us. We're on a first-name basis now. <laughs> and those friendships may be the best part. Because eventually the devices go dark. But the conversation continues. <laughs> proving that as a communication tool, smartphones always work best powered off. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Steve Hartman on the road. Come by next week. Oh, I am. In Fort Myers, Florida. Already. CBS's Steve Hartman heads to New England for a real-life Queen's Gambit on the road. The students at Weatherby Elementary in Hampton, Maine, seem peaceful enough but start a war on this turf. And these rookies, with their night moves, become a royal pawn in the chest to anyone who dares try to dethrone their king. 
which is how they became the new Maine State Chess Champions. It was so, like, exciting. Everybody was cheering. Just, like, feels like you could fly. A special, like, one in a million. In fact, the only thing more unlikely than their success is where they found it. Here, in the broom closet. School custodian David Bishop used to play chess as a kid. So when, years later, he found himself cleaning the hall outside the Weatherby Chess Club, he says he felt drawn like he had to be part of it. And at the time, I, I didn't really have any thought of how to teach. I'd never done that before. I didn't really think he had a good background like for doing it, but he obviously does. His name is Mr. Bishop, which is pretty cool. He took over. And? And here we are. <laughs> Five minute game. Where they are is a community of intensely focused little minds who play like a real kingdom is at stake. What happens is, yes, there's an attack here. And although no one here is a master. The king's coming out way too early. Right? Mr. Bishop has convinced every last one of them that they have the potential. What I tell them is, if you love it, you're going to be better than the top player we have. They say, no, that can't be. Yes, if you love it, you'll never give up, and you're going to get better and better as the months and years go by. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking our job descriptions are a box, confining who we are and what we do. But David Bishop sees it differently. He says when they told him to make this school shine, they never said how. I found my purpose. Steve Hartman on the road. It's a lesson learned. Near Bangor, Maine. Sometimes life's greatest gifts can come from where we least expect them to. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. Time to go for a walk. When John Ivanowski's kidney started failing and he needed a transplant, the most likely donor match was his daughter, Delaney. But John would have no part of her. And I was like, well, why can't he just have my kidney? I just take it now. I said, no way. Why so adamant that she not help? She's the only thing I got. 15 years earlier, John's only other child, Dawson, died of cancer. So the thought of Delaney going through this surgery, no matter how small the risk, was more than he could bear. After losing Dawson, I, 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 I don't know what I would do. Fortunately, a donor stepped forward. Yep, an anonymous donor. An anonymous living donor who also just so happened to be living in his basement. Unbeknownst to John, Delaney had spent the last year working with the transplant center here at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, getting tested, going through protocols, and all the while completely deceiving her father until this very moment. Oh my God, are you kidding me? John says he sat there for quite a while not knowing what to feel. <laughs> I started crying. Hard to process everything, you know? It's because like... anger and gratitude <laughs> have never been intertwined <laughs> like they were at that I'm moment. Like, I'm like, should I kill you now or kill you later? As time has passed, has gratitude overtaken the anger? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most parents would give anything for their children. And when those tables turn, it's not really a parent's place to protest because the kids are just following the example you set. I would do it over and over and over again if it meant to like save him his life and have him here with me. How do you say thank you? Just uh, take care of this gift. The gift from her and the gift that is her. Steve Hartman on the road in St. Louis. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a story about faith, friendship, and freedom. Seeing her there, cuddled up with her crossword, you would never guess 80-year-old retired school teacher Ginny Schrappen had a pen pal in the penitentiary, especially not one accused of that terrible six-letter word that starts with M. He was in prison for murder. So I gotta ask, what were you thinking? 
I've been accused of being naive before, <laughs> and that's okay. I wasn't worried. He's not gonna come and get me. No. We'll answer that door in a minute. But first, how did this sweet little lady cross paths with Lamar Johnson, a man serving a life sentence in a Missouri prison? 25 years ago, a deacon at Jenny's church outside St. Louis handed her a letter from this prisoner. The guy had written the church hoping that someone, anyone, would just write back. And so I did it. What was it gonna cost me? A stamp. Over the next two decades, they corresponded constantly. And although Ginny says she could tell right from the start that there was no way that nice boy committed murder, it would take the state of Missouri 28 years to confirm her intuition. Is granted. <laughs> A couple months ago, after the Midwest Innocence Project got involved and the real killer confessed, Lamar was exonerated at the age of 49. You did it, Lamar. Lamar spent the next few weeks doing all the things he couldn't do in prison. Mr. Johnson hugging a tree. Including traveling to see one of his best friends at her house for the very first time. Oh, look at you. Ginny welcomed him in. Gave him a tour. This was a new window. A box of his favorite cereal. She knows me. <laughs> and one last letter. You deserve the best, Lamar. But Lamar says the greatest gift wow. will always be the confidence mm. she instilled in him. Mm -hmm. Especially when somebody is innocent. You want someone to believe in you. Because when you have people that believe in you and they won't give up on you, then it makes it harder for you to give up on yourself. Lamar says that's what helped get him through 28 years of injustice and now inspires him to serve a life of friendship. Steve Hartman on the road near St. Louis. What a guy. This week, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with the story of a nurse and the life-saving treatment of compassion. At Community Hospital North in Indianapolis, Newborn intensive care nurse Katrina Mullen has a reputation for going above and beyond. But as you'll soon see, the lengths she went to for these triplets and their 14-year-old mother is beyond compare. Oh, being that age and having all three babies premature and sick was going to be a hard road for her. Katrina was once a teenage mother herself, and she knew that this young mom, Shariah Small, didn't have a stable home life. So, even after the babies were discharged, Katrina continued to visit them and shower them with gifts. Pacifiers or bottles, three matching outfits for them. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is driving you to do all this? Just love. I mean, I loved her, I loved them, and I just wanted to see her be a successful parent. She was just there. She was there emotionally, she was there physically, she was there mentally which was all new for Shariah. Yeah, she was really the only person there. But Shariah still didn't have a proper home for the kids. So eventually, the Department of Child Services intervened. They began looking for a foster family, or more like multiple foster families, because finding one place for a teenage mother and her triplets would be nearly impossible. And that's when Shariah got a text message that simply said, I can't wait for you to come home. Never mind that Katrina already had five kids of her own. What color is that? She took on these other four pop, pop. without giving it a second pop, thought. Pop, pop, pop. It's been exhausting. Uh oh It's been crazy and busy. Oh! But I've never once sat and said, I wish I hadn't done this. But that seems illogical. You just listed a bunch of reasons <laughs> why this is a terrible idea. And then you I say, think, I would absolutely do it again. I would absolutely do it again. In fact, just a few months ago, Katrina adopted Shariah, who just finished high school and now plans to go to college. <laughs> all thanks to the nurse who went above and beyond <laughs> and beyond some more. Steve Hartman on the road in Indianapolis. 
Finally tonight, sometimes the smallest gestures can have the biggest impact on someone else's life. CBS's Steve Hartman found such a story on the road. A few years ago, Melody Morrow of New York City hurt her foot and needed physical therapy. But she says what really made her feel better was paying the bills. You asked for a receipt. Correct. And it comes in the mail. Correct. And what was special about it? On the envelope, on the front of the envelope, it had these little music notes. Her name is Melody, but this is a big health system. Personal touches on billing statements aren't typically their thing. And then it began. Every month thereafter, her payment receipt arrived in the mail. And every month, a new drawing. They started out simple, like this treble clef. But as the months progressed, the envelopes got more and more elaborate. And this was original art, created anonymously just for her. It's hard to even describe. It was incredible. Melody did call her provider, MJHS Health System, and asked if by chance there was anyone in the billing department who was artistic. She says the phone got quiet, and then she heard, hey, Emily, it's for you. I'm like, uh oh, what I do now? What were you hoping was gonna come from this? I like to make people happy. Accounting clerk Emily Margolis is hardly a frontline caregiver, but she says she can still make people better, and her drawings are her way. Melody was so grateful, Emily decided to ramp up her game even further. <laughs> she began taking Melody's mailings home at night and spent hours turning those plain white business envelopes into masterpieces. Then I started adding rhinestones. <laughs> I know I got involved with the gold leaf. That was fun. I had never <laughs> done that leaf. before. Yeah. Where was this going to stop? I, I know how much she had left to pay. <laughs> <laughs> this was the last mailing, but not the end of the story. Hello. Mwah. Melody and Emily became friends and are now co-curators of an exhibit at this Manhattan coffee shop, showcasing Emily's enveloping creations. Although Melody says what's really on display here is the healing power of kindness. This was a stranger, and she was doing that just for me. And that's the beauty of it. A note of harmony. Steve Hartman on the road in New York. CBS's Steve Hartman finds that sometimes the best lessons happen on the bus ride home from school. Here's this week's On the Road. It was end of day for students at Carter Middle School in Warren, Michigan. But for those on bus 46 that April afternoon, it was the beginning of an unforgettable ordeal. And all of a sudden, the brakes get slammed. We all were just terrified and shocked. And that's when I like looked up and saw him. Seventh grader Dylan Reeves had grabbed the steering wheel. Soon after, police called the boy's father and stepmother, Steve and Iretta. Are you the parent of Dylan Reeves? And I said, yes. And I go, what do you do? And he goes, no, this is a good phone call. Your son's a hero. He stopped the bus. Stop the bus? Like, what? What? The officer went on to explain, and security footage shows, how Dylan noticed the driver was having a medical emergency and immediately sprang from his seat. I just knew what to do in that moment. The bus was swerving off the road. So Dylan took the wheel, hit the brake, and gained control of the situation, saving driver and students. Someone call 911. A true hero, no doubt. But we still had a question. Why didn't anyone else notice what was happening? Well, turns out. Had my AirPods in. Virtually every kid. I was looking at my phone. Was on a device. I was on my phone playing a little game. We hear a lot about the consequences of too much screen time. But one thing I never considered until now is the loss of situational awareness. What's happening around them? And yet somehow, at least one kid on that bus instantly recognized what was happening. Any guesses as to why? I know why, because my son does not have a cell phone. And Steve says, that's the lesson here. What else are you going to do when you don't have a phone? You're going to look at people, you're going to notice stuff, you're going to look out the window. It's a very powerful lesson. Maybe 
change world kind of lesson. I don't know. At least a save the bus kind of lesson. And they say reason enough to hold off getting him a phone for another day. How do you feel about that? Whatever. My parents are old school. But for good reason. I guess. Sometimes even heroes have it hard. Steve Hartman on the road near Detroit. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to America's heartland, where the people live up to the name. If there was ever an election in this country for kindest American, the people of Galveston, Indiana know who they'd nominate. Because I think he's out there to help everybody. That's what he's known for. He just always has been. It's the cloth he's cut from. Just a special guy, very special guy. So who is this great humanitarian who lifts up the people of Galveston? The same man who puts them down. Meet 89-year-old gravedigger Alan McCloskey. Alan has been at this job since 1952 and refuses to retire because he says a new gravedigger might not square the corners as precisely, might not care as deeply for all those loving souls. Yeah. People that we went to school with and worked with. And what was your hardest one? My wife. How'd you get through that? I figured she'd want me to do it. Alan and Barbara had three kids, but his definition of family extends well beyond blood, which may explain why a good chunk of the town gathered recently for what Alan thought was someone else's birthday party but was really a celebration of him. At the party, he got an official Guinness World Record for longest career as a grave digger, 70 years and counting. But more importantly, he was recognized for the thousands of odd jobs he's done for people. It's his side hustle, but with a twist. We'd ask Alan for a bill and he wouldn't give us a bill. Never get a bill, uh, you know, I'll send you a bill. He said, I'll just catch up with you later. And then- Later never you, came. You never, hear, you never hear anything more about it. It was the running joke at his party. Anybody in here still waiting on him to send you a bill for work this year? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I did ask Alan about this. They say they can't get a bill from you. Oh. But all I got <laughs> was a hearty laugh. <laughs> Alan McCloskey, unassuming by profession and persona, but also a bold beacon for anyone in search of meaning. Alan has figured out what life is about. It's not the money that makes him happy. I truly believe Alan has figured out where enough is at. He's found enough. And strange thing about finding enough, you often end up with more than enough. Steve Hartman on the road in Galveston, Indiana. Finally tonight, Harvard Law School is considered to be one of the most prestigious academic institutions in the world. CBS's Steve Hartman introduces us to one of its newest graduates on the road. No one has ever attended Harvard Law School for its sparkling glass doors or smudge-free countertops. In fact, Support staff here say most students never even notice their efforts, with one remarkable exception. He says, I just want to give you a hug and, you know, say hi to you. They say one day, this one student started thanking all of them. Thank you for what you do. And this is something very different. I'm like, what is this kid's angle? Food service worker Brion Merchant was skeptical. Before that, but once I heard his background, that's when it just all made sense. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you see us because you're one of us. Mm -hmm. For sure. That student is Rehan Staten. Before coming to Harvard Law, he worked in sanitation. My job was to refurbish the dumpsters. I've heard people literally point to me and point to my coworker and say, like, don't be like them. I think it just reminds me to stay humble and um, just remember I wasn't always standing here. Today, Rehan has not only maintained his humility, he has multiplied it. Earlier this year, Rehan started a nonprofit called the Reciprocity Effect. Its mission? 
to guarantee that from now on and forever, the support staff here at Harvard Law would not only be seen, they would be celebrated. This was the first support staff awards banquet, honoring in Oscar-like fashion the custodians and cafeteria workers and everyone else who makes this place possible. The feeling of knowing that you are appreciated will always go a long way, especially for those who don't know that. I think that's what makes what Rahan did so special is because you didn't even realize how unseen you were until you were seen. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is kind of nice. Rahan Staten. In the coming days, a lot of graduates will stand high on a stage, a great vantage point to finally see all the people who lifted them there. <laughs> Steve Hartman on the road in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road for a wedding and a bride you won't soon forget. The dress was white, but according to residents at the O'Bannon Terrace Retirement Home outside Cincinnati, everything else about this wedding was far from traditional. The ceremony was very, oh, I'm looking for the right word. Crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's Dottie. Is that you? 76-year-old yeah. Dottie Fideli, <laughs> who had been divorced for decades, was always the life of the party. A costume wearing, attention glaring, but forever caring friend. Dottie's a very loving person. Always in a great mood. Always just doing something to make somebody laugh and happy. <gasps> but even though she seems so vivacious and confident to others, before she found the love of her life, Dottie saw a very different person in the mirror. A little dummy. I couldn't read and people have conversations and I had to stay out of them because I didn't understand. So I started reading. I didn't tell nobody. Started teaching yourself? Yes, because practice makes perfect. Let's see. It took this, almost two years of nightly practice, now, but today she has conquered her illiteracy. White Water Canal. And Dottie says it was reading that helped her find love again. A love like she'd never known, love of self. And so last month, Dottie married Dottie. Love is patient. Obviously, it wasn't a real wedding. Love is kind. But Dottie says it was meant as a serious reminder that before you can share love, you first have to glean it from the only known source within. And you'll find out it's all a bed of roses. The message that she put across that day of how life should be really touched a lot of people's hearts. And now opens the possibility for perhaps a real wedding. Is there a man out there that could top the, the love you have right now? <laughs> That's not happening. <laughs> You're happy with who you married? I'm, I'm happy with who I am. <laughs> Sounds like this one's taken. Yeah, I'm going home. Steve Hartman on the road near Cincinnati. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a Memphis gym owner who found building muscle is nothing compared to building someone's character. It's okay. Here at the God Body Gym in Memphis, owner Roderick Duncan says real change never happens overnight. Ten. But he says it always starts in an instant. Seven. Or in this case, an instant cup of coffee. Two. Time. A few months ago, Roderick says he noticed someone behind his gym. Saw this guy sitting in the vehicle. He says the man was sleeping in one of his old cars. Homeless? Homeless guy, he had to be. So, camera rolling, he opened the door and told him to get out. Come on, get up out of my car, man. And because the door doesn't lock, the next day, same problem. Look at you, man. And he kept coming back. He kept coming back. And so it went until Roderick tried a different approach. Before I could knock on the window, I said, you know what? I came back in here, I made him a cup of coffee. And on those grounds, Roderick began to build a relationship with 24-year-old Brian Taylor. He learned about his troubled childhood and his drinking problem, and then got him some clothes, took him to get an ID, and drove him to job interviews. He even gave him a spot on his couch. 
Brian says he couldn't be more grateful, but he doesn't always show it, whether not following the rules or violating a trust. Roderick says there have been many times over the past few months where he's told Brian, that's it, that's the last straw. And every time, it's not. Some people need more than one chance. You know, some people, it takes a, it takes a while for most kids to stop bumping their head. You always have to work on you. And that patience may be the greatest gift he's given this young man. Everything you did yesterday is what got you in the situation today. So everything you do today is going to be preparing you for tomorrow. And both men agree tomorrow is looking brighter. I got a job. I got more confidence. I got a smile on my face. Good thing, because Roderick says if Brian messes up one more time, he's done helping. That's it. Why do I not believe that? Well, I don't believe it either. <laughs> <laughs> Unconditional love. It's crazy. <laughs> forgiveness to a fault. Steve Hartman on the road in Memphis. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman visits an old friend who likes giving complete strangers the benefit of the doubt. We find out why on the road. From a desperate place across the Atlantic, a suspicious message went out. My name is Joel from Liberia, West Africa. I need some assistance from you, business or financial assistance that will help empower me. And 6,000 miles away, a stranger answered. I just wanted to go down this rabbit hole and see what were the tricks that they used to get people. You were wrong about him. So I took him for a scammer, but he, he showed me that he, there was a different side to him. As we first reported in 2018, Ben Taylor of Ogden, Utah befriended the stranger and helped him help himself. He worked with Joel to make a little booklet about his life. And I sold it online to whoever was interested in the story or whoever was just interested in helping a guy out. And from those sales, Joel was able to earn hundreds of dollars. Is this your home? Oh yeah, it is my home. Ben even visited to see the results of their partnership firsthand. Brand new roof. That looks good, man. Yeah, yeah. As you might expect, after that story first aired, lots of people tried to seize on Ben's kindness. His spam folder blew up with supposedly desperate pleas. Like the woman in Cameroon who said she needed money for reconstructive plastic surgery. The same letter had been circulating on the internet for years. It was even posted on a scam reporting website. But I read into her story and it, it, it felt like something that I couldn't ignore. So you believe somebody again? I did a lot of work to kind of get to the bottom of it. Turns out the story is true. Chica Ordery had a botched surgery as a child that left her with intermittent but excruciating pain. Hi, Chica Ordery. So? A couple months ago. It's me, Mr. Ben. Ben did as he'd done before. <laughs> How are you? Flew to see the woman so many others had written off as a scammer and showed her the book, this is the book. that would pay for her operation. That you wrote. <laughs> it's just a lot of fun to see people kind of be the hero of their own story. Hi, Chief Ordery. You look like someone who just got out of surgery. Thanks to you, Mr. Ben. Twice now, Ben Taylor has gone halfway around the world to help a stranger and inspire you. Not to go answer your spam mail, just open your mind to the possibility that some people may be better than you think. Yeah, how are you doing? Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. Finally tonight, the journey through junior high school can be a long one for some students. CBS's Steve Hartman has a story of one teenager who truly went the distance on the road. Under St. Louis's other arch lies Harris Stowe State University. Historically black university. Where last month, school president Latanya Collins Smith awarded a full ride, four year scholarship to a boy she just met and knew virtually nothing about. That kid, that day, it was something that resonated with my spirit. 14-year-old Xavier Jones had started the day on a mission. His grandfather's car wasn't working and Xavier really wanted to be someplace. So he started walking six miles, two hours, through tough neighborhoods, busy traffic, and blazing sun. 
At one point, he got so thirsty, he begged someone for a dollar to buy something to drink. Thought about turning back, but pressed on. All just so he could walk another 30 feet and collect his eighth grade diploma. If you, like, really want to get something, then you have to work hard for it. He wanted to be present. Speaks volumes, Steve. Half the battle is showing up. <laughs> so, on the spot, Colin Smith, who just happened to be in the auditorium that day, awarded Xavier a scholarship. Xavier was thrilled, albeit for the wrong reason. He thought that a full ride meant he would get a ride to college, like that he wouldn't have to walk here again. Fortunately, he's got four years of high school to process what it all means. I mean, with the whole engineering piece that you want to do. Until then, he plans to keep up his grades, which were already excellent, and keep stoking that fire in his belly. Okay. It basically comes from who I am and the kind of person that I want to be. Which is the same kind of person Latanya Collin Smith wants in her school. You know, oftentimes at colleges, we spend a lot of time on standardized test scores because that's who you are, right? It's not true. Sometimes who you are is better measured by how far you've come. Steve Hartman on the road in St. Louis. Finally tonight, Steve Hartman goes on the road with a man using the power of music to honor his past and provide hope for the future. What would compel a man, a retired businessman, to become a street performer, playing for bills in a bucket at the age of 83? Is it love? Loss? Purpose? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> On our honeymoon. Larry Kingsley says the love part is Georgianne his wife of 23 years. Did she always put her head right there? Usually, I liked it there. <laughs> Unfortunately, she's also the loss part. Four years ago, Georgianne was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And the doctor says, you know, it's gonna be difficult. I said, I know, but I'm married to her, so I'm gonna be with her. And with her, he was. When Larry got out the old trumpet he bought back in his Air Force days and started playing three times a week on a sidewalk in Cary, North Carolina. Larry says Georgianne loved it, although she was confused. In fact, she used to yell at him. Why don't you get a real job, she'd say. Assumed he was out here panhandling. And Larry laughed it off, knowing that in a way, this had become his job, his mission. Every donation goes toward finding a cure. Every dollar, a fulfillment of Larry's newfound purpose. The day that she died, I played that night. Wow. But in my mind, it's, I just say the show goes on. After Georgianne died last year, Larry started playing six nights a week. He has now raised more than $15,000 and has vowed to keep it up until Alzheimer's is just a memory. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Cary, North Carolina. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a young fan who found her musical hero from another generation. While most tweens in America are fawning over Bieber, Swift, and Styles, 11-year-old Paisley Gardner has a different idol a singer she kept hearing on the radio. It sounds like an angel somehow. Sounds like an angel. Yeah. What? Huh? Like, okay, well, that's kind of odd. Parents, Tony and Jessica, say they didn't know what to think when a few months ago their daughter became obsessed with that buttery smooth voice of that 70s soft rock legend, Michael McDonald. They say Paisley was smitten. Without an image of who this person was. So one day she Googled a picture of Michael McDonald and she came running up the stairs and flailed herself on the bed and was like, no, no. Her pop star turned out to be a grand pop. I just had to deal with it, but it's okay. 
So last month, Tony got tickets to see McDonald here in Des Moines, Iowa. Got them at the last minute for $7 a piece. Eat your heart out, Swifties. And then surprised Paisley with the concert of her lifetime. You wanna go see him? Yes. Let's go. And I almost screamed. You did scream. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Michael McDonald. <laughs> McDonald is on tour with the Doobie Brothers. I love you, Michael! Paisley says she was the youngest fan in the audience by a generation, and the only one who actually got to talk to McDonald. Sort of. He said thank you to me. That was it. He said thank you. And that he was enough for her. But he looked at me in the eye and said thank you. After my visit, I reached back out to Paisley, and we talked about how cool it would be to have a real chat with him. The odds of that happening would be very, very slim. Or maybe not. What's that? Wait a second, what? How are you, darling? What? It's okay, sweetie. Eventually, Paisley recovered for a nice conversation. Is your best friend Christopher Cross? Well, he's one of my best friends. And an even nicer invitation. We'll have you see the show from backstage, maybe. How's that? <laughs> a sweet gift for the girl who learned there's so much more to music appreciation. I love you. Then hair color. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Des Moines. Finally tonight, one woman who proves age is just a number. CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a 103-year-old lobster woman who shows no signs of stopping. Max Oliver is an old salt, but to his crewmate on this lobster boat, Max is but a child, her child. As we first reported a couple years ago, then, 101-year-old Virginia Oliver was Maine's oldest lobster fisherman. Three days a week, May through November, you could find Virginia out here on Penobscot Bay, tackling one of the most hazardous jobs in the country. Have they ever gotten you? Oh, of course. <laughs> Once she got cut so badly, she needed seven stitches. And the doctor said to me, what are you out there lobstering for? Good question. And I said, because I want to. I think he might have thought that was a little too dangerous for somebody well, of your age. I don't care what he thought. Well, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Virginia had been lobstering on and off since the age of seven. She used to go out with her father. It was man's work then, not another girl in sight. But nine decades later, she was the master of the sea. After Max hauled in the traps, Virginia measured the lobsters, Don't go on. tossed out the small ones, and, throw it away. and then tamed the claws of the keepers. Who's the boss out there? I am. <laughs> she don't give up. What would she say if you said, oh, I'm ready to retire? You better have something wrong with you. You better have something wrong with you. It's been two years since our visit, and I'm happy to report that almost nothing has changed. Later this month, at the age of 103, Virginia will begin her 95th lobstering season. There is a children's book now, and she's gained some celebrity, but Virginia remains the same humble lobster woman with the same retirement plan. When I die. When you die. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, no time soon. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Rockland, Maine. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road for an update on a story about perseverance and resilience. A lot of dogs think they're human, but Dexter takes it to a whole nother level, to the point where I can now safely say, I have seen everything. As we first reported about a year ago, Dexter lives in Uray, Colorado, where this bicolor, bipedal Britney Spaniel turns heads wherever he goes. Oh, no! oh my God. Dexter's owner, Kenty Pasek, says this isn't a trick she taught. It's an adaptation he made after a near-death experience. Hey, come on. When Dexter was a puppy, he escaped his yard, darted into traffic, and got hit by a car. He lost one front leg and the other was badly damaged. So everyone assumed, to get around, he would need some kind of adaptive equipment. And he did use a wheelchair for a while, until one day when Kenty set the pooch at the foot of her porch without the wheelchair. 
and I ran in to go get my cup of coffee, came out, and he was right here where he is right now. And I was like, how is this going on? How did you figure it out? I put him back down there, and I grabbed my phone to see what was going on. <laughs> here is the video she recorded. And I was like, oh, we're into something totally different. You never know where life's going to take you. You never know. Since we first told this story, Dexter, who was already a minor celebrity in Ure, has become a major celebrity across the nation, taking to the skies for appearances in TV shows and pet expos. He has pranced in the shadow of New York skyscrapers and Washington's cherry trees. And along the way, this dog has gathered more fans and followers than a lot of our most popular humans. Follow him on Instagram. Oh, good! The whole thing takes absurdity to new heights. But to many, Dexter is no joke. In this pile of mail he receives monthly are hundreds of letters of heartfelt gratitude. I'm recovering from intensive radiation treatments for breast cancer, and you certainly bring joy to my day. Where humans see obstacles. I mean, just... Often dogs beg to differ. Dexter shows us, why aren't you out there doing the things you want to do? Because he has. Off he goes. And in doing so has proven that sometimes getting knocked down is the only way to see how tall you stand. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Uray, Colorado. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman heads into the spin cycle on the road. In the shadow of the Colorado Rockies, we found a man with a mountainous dilemma. Well, it doesn't look too intimidating from here. What to do with all the antique washing machines he has collected? You've got a problem. I do have a problem. <laughs> As we first reported a few years ago, Lee Maxwell had to build a warehouse to store them all. First automatic, 1937. And what's more? is there's more. No. Way more. No. Behind that one warehouse, no. <laughs> there's a second warehouse, again, filled with nothing but washing machines. I told you it was insane. <laughs> it is one of the largest personal collections of anything in America. And Lee says it all began, innocently enough, with a farm auction. He came home with so many washing machines, his wife Barbara wanted to hang him out to dry. Yeah. She was thinking bad things about me. <laughs> yeah. That I Very lost my things. rocker, and I think maybe I did. Huh? <laughs> Squeezer scrubber combination. Today, there are about 1,500 different machines in his collection. Goes up and down. Ones that you power. Push it. And ones that use power. So you put your sheep on here. Yeah. He's even got a model of one that was never mass produced that ran on child labor. So this, there would be one kid here and they would just go. One here and then they'd teeter-totter. Isn't that inventive? So what's your dilemma now? Trying to find a home for it so the thing can be preserved. Do you think about this often? I do, every day. You need a Steve Hartman or a Bill Gates or something. He'd like to find a benefactor. <laughs> Preferably a Bill Gates. <laughs> Someone who could build a proper museum. But in the four years since we first told this story... I have zero takers. In fact, his problem has only gotten worse. Lee has added dozens of new ones. There's always a beautiful one just around the corner. Got a question for you. And as for the machine around this corner... Barbara says, no progress there either. Do you know how to turn this on? Absolutely not. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> Washing machines have changed. But men, not so much. Will you tell me? Steve Hartman, on the road in Eaton, Colorado. Finally, tonight, from the ashes of ruin comes a story of true love. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman, on the road. Bride and groom Elizabeth and Jake Landon say their wedding was like a fairy tale. You may kiss your bride. Everything we could have dreamed of until... My dad was doing his father of the bride speech and just a minute in, Hi. he was interrupted by some of our guests. Hose on fire. And that was the end of that. As we first reported a couple years ago, the cottage right next to their wedding venue on Mackinac Island, Michigan, caught fire, and everyone had to evacuate the area. This is a picture of the newly fleds, abandoning their reception.
I just figured we had to walk away from that. So we just started heading towards the church. The church where they'd just been married. This time, they prayed for everyone's safety. And in the end, no one was hurt, and even the building was saved. Seemed like the only thing that couldn't be salvaged was their wedding day. But unbeknownst to the bride and groom, while they were in that church praying, angels were swooping in from all over town. We needed to step up and do the right thing. First, the chef at the venue took all 120 meals to a restaurant next door. We just cooked it, sauced it, and off down the street it went. Down the street to a resort that had an event space available. And we started just pulling everything that we had. And what they didn't have, yet another restaurant provided. So we got it all on a card and pushed it down Main Street. And because of everyone's efforts, it's gonna be great. in less than an hour, the bride was back to blushing. And what did you charge for this help? Um, nothing. I didn't charge him anything. Nothing? No. To have them pick up a reception like, out of ashes in a very literal sense made the wedding better than we ever could have imagined. Two years later, they are now one person more. Last month, Elizabeth, Jake, and baby Owen returned to Mackinac Island to celebrate their anniversary, this time without the dramatics, but with some perspective. Dare I say you're glad it worked out the way it did? I caught up with the family over Zoom. I don't know if I, would, if I quite use the word glad, but <laughs> that was one day, one part of our life journey, and now we have a much more important part now. Adorable evidence that even when life turns on you, it often turns back. Steve Hartman, CBS News, on the road. Finally tonight, a reminder of some of the most important things in life. Old friends, old cars, and a chance to feel young again. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. If there's anything even remotely good about having ALS, 56-year-old Craig Reagan of College Station, Texas, says it may be a heightened sense of gratitude. Gratitude for caregivers like his wife Nancy, friends like his dog Taco, and memories like his 73 Ford Mustang, which, even though it stopped running back in 1999, has taken up permanent residence at his house. It's a big paperweight. A <laughs> big paperweight. Why did you keep it? I just had such an attachment to it. He's had it since high school. He was proud of it. Craig had hoped that someday his boys might want to fix it up with him, but they showed no interest in cars. Then he planned to do it himself, but ALS had other plans. So the car sat rotting until some old high school friends caught wind. And everybody, as soon as I called these guys, they were like, yeah, let's do it. It's in your heart. You just got to help somebody like that. So for the next year, they went to work on it, put in hundreds of hours, while other classmates paid for parts. And not long ago, are you ready, Craig? That big, immovable paperweight One, was ready to two, lift off. Three. It was just almost like a piece of him that came back to life. That came back to life. Pretty vividly, actually. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready when you are. Craig was diagnosed with ALS in 2016. The disease is incurable, but he has clearly found his treatment. What's it like to be back in it? I feel like I'm a teenager. <laughs> and as for the people who made this moment possible, they insist the bigger gift was the lesson they received. He reminded us of something maybe we forgot. Yeah, just do good stuff for people. That's all that matters, just do good stuff today. Do good stuff today. No better medicine on earth. Steve Hartman on the road in College Station, Texas. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road for a story about love, loss, and hope. Working at this vehicle inspection site in Katy, Texas Signals work. was never part of Jalen Gray's Great. plan. Far from it. He actually wanted to be a park ranger, but quit college and gave up the dream. 
it's not a really good feeling giving up at all. But um, sometimes it's not quitting; it's just doing the right thing. Yeah, I had to do what I had to do. So. Go, go, go! As we first reported last year, Jalen's little brother Julian became his sole priority. He's my reason. All right, let's go. His reason and his responsibility. Their mother and only parent died three years ago. I just miss her so much. From that day on, I swore, you know, at all costs, I'm protecting them. Unfortunately, their lives went from bad to unbearable. Nowhere to go. After that big freeze hit Texas a couple years ago, the pipes burst in their house, the one their mother left them, and ruined everything. So strange times. Then the contractor Jalen hired to fix it took their life savings. Tragic, isn't it? The boys were pretty much homeless, living with their last surviving close relative when a nonprofit called Katie Responds caught wind. The group fixes up houses after natural disasters. Over the years, they've helped more than 100 families, but few more worthy than those boys. Yeah, it breaks your heart. Had to help. Had to. Executive Director Ron Peters. They had no idea people would, would want to jump in and help them. Which may explain their speechless surprise. I was overwhelmed. Thanks to an army of donors and volunteers, the brothers are finally and forever back in their mother's house. Fully renovated, better than ever. There's just so many nice people in this room right now, and it makes me so happy. Since we first told this story, life for the boys has only gotten better. Viewers pitched in and are now paying for Jalen to go back to college to become a park ranger. All expenses paid? All expenses paid. What a turn of events for you. Yeah, I know. Complete 180. This random acts of kindness helped me get there. When their mother died, Julian and Jalen thought all they had was each other. But they were off by one whole nation. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Katy, Texas. Finally tonight, sometimes the best lessons in life are those we learn on the way to school. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman, On the Road. <laughs> this may look like a normal family reunion, but as you'll soon see, Reed Moon of Zelianopal, Pennsylvania, is no ordinary patriarch. Good to see you. And this is no ordinary family. This is Anagail. Far from it. Bethany. Here's DJ. The handsome lad. That's Lewis. How many kids do you have? I'll say 200. Maybe even more. No, they're not biologically my kids. But emotionally, they surely are. That's how attached he is to the students who rode his school bus, a job he held for 27 years even though it wasn't exactly his first choice. Reed sort of fell into the job. Well, not sort of, he, he did fall into the job. In 1990, he fell off a roof working as a handyman. After that, he wanted a job closer to the ground. But ironically, he says no job has ever lifted him higher. It's his children. And being in a position where you can love kids every single day is a lovely position to be in. Like he just made everybody feel safe and loved and cared for. Do anything he possibly could to help somebody. I don't really have a teacher that I remember. I remember my bus driver. So many kids feel the exact same way, that more than 20 of them had Reed, who was also a pastor, officiate their weddings. A bond so strong that even though Reed retired years ago, former students gathered recently for one last ride and they're finding their assigned seat. Right here in the front. <laughs> that they had 20 years ago. And now their child is sitting on their lap and that kind of feeling is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and as for his secret to fostering all this. So he only had two rules on the bus. Show everyone love and respect. Love and respect to everybody. It's a lesson they carry with them. Love and respect. And on them. Got a love and respect tattoo. I'm convinced that when you love and respect people, most of the time, that's what you're going to get back. Get back. Have a good day, Mr. Smith. By the busload. Thanks, Rosie. Have a great day at school, honey. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Zelianopal, Pennsylvania. Learn lots.
Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to find the often overlooked men and women who are the heartbeat of our nation. We set out this week to find someone who exemplifies the spirit of the American worker and wound up here in Cleveland, Tennessee at Tenova Healthcare, where 85-year-old Doris Caldwell holds one of the least glamorous, most physically challenging jobs in the hospital. Hello, my name is Doris. I'm the housekeeping. Can I come in and clean your floor? She's been at this 50 years. Okay, thank you. But what makes her special isn't just her longevity, her geniality, or even her flexibility. Could you bend over and touch your toes? You want to see me? <laughs> Instead, what makes Doris remarkable is that cleaning rooms is, and always has been, her dream job. Back in the 60s, Doris used to pass by this hospital and say to herself, I'm going to work there someday. She didn't care if it was as a doctor or a dishwasher. All she wanted was to play some role in making people better. Dreaming of helping people, be with people. And my dream is still going on. And her attitude, still inspiring others. From the CEO. Her aura is something that you want to be around. To the doctors. I've never heard her have a single complaint. To the maintenance crews. She just likes to work. Everyone is stumped by her stamina. I asked her one time when she was going to retire, and she said, no. <laughs> just no. No. I think I would just dry up and fly away. <laughs> Her vow to stay on is reassuring to everyone at Tenova, except maybe this one nurse. Because I don't think I can retire and her still working. <laughs> Her daughter Sharon has been here 44 years. She's stuck, but feels blessed to be so. She's just an amazing lady. This Labor Day, we celebrate all those dutiful, inexhaustible American workers, those who cheerfully keep this country running, those who will enjoy Monday, just not as much as Tuesday. Is there anything else I can do for you, sir? Steve Hartman, on the road. You have a great day. In Cleveland, Tennessee. Finally tonight, the story of a man on a never-ending mission of kindness and how it's changing lives. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. At the bottom of a hole in Chesterfield County, Virginia, utility worker Calvin Gaudet is fixing a leaky water main. But no gusher down here compares to the fountain of good deeds he delivers up there. Whether it's buying coffee for the next car, take care of the people that behind me, or groceries for a random shop, I'm gonna pay for this. Calvin gives away about half his income to total strangers. I'm gonna fill your truck up for you. In return, he may get a thank you. Where's that? At best, but he remains undaunted. You don't never know. You could do something for somebody or talk to someone and you can change the whole situation. He says it happened once. You can come around, thank you. A few months ago, Calvin was in this Burger King drive-through when he happened to look in his rear view mirror and saw a woman who just seemed sad. So Calvin did what Calvin does, bought her meal. Only this time, his random act of kindness would not soon be forgotten. Somebody to do something that nice for you on that very moment when I thought nothing could make me happy again. It just touched my heart. This is Andy. Denise Walters had just lost her husband of 41 years. I just wish she was still here. And says Calvin's kindness was exactly what she needed at exactly the right time. In fact, it had such a profound effect, she chased him down, told his boss, and got him recognized before the County Board of Supervisors. He saw that I was upset and showed compassion to a complete stranger. How you doing? Since then, they have stayed in touch and grown their circle. Nice to meet you, I'm Chris. Nice to meet you, Chris. I told us you may have lost your husband, but you gained a family. He's just an amazing man, just an amazing man. He's also her new role model. I want you to have this. Denise is now doing the same thing. He has shown me the way. So you feel like you're on a mission now? Oh, absolutely. If he can do this, I can do this. Okay. And maybe I have a hug. we 
can do this. Go spread that joy somewhere, okay? Steve Hartman. Thank you. On the road in Chesterfield County, Virginia. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with an important lesson about the past and the healing power of time. Never mind the limousine, marching band, and red carpet. What amazes 75-year-old Marvin Jones the most Hi. is that he's back at his old high school, period. Because when I left Brunswick High School in 1966, I said I would never return. It was a different time. Schools across the South were desegregating, including Brunswick High in Lawrenceville, Virginia, where it fell to Marvin and these 14 other kids to take that first painful step. On the bus, the students would bring KKK flyers. And when I would come down the hall, they'll close their nose and say, here comes a skunk, okay? I felt as if I had leprosy. Even decades later, those memories haunted. So to heal, Marvin decided to put pen to paper, writing letters to the very students who tormented him. What did you say in the letters? I would tell what each person had done to me. Marvin wrote about 90 such letters to former classmates, pouring out his pain whether people wanted to hear it or not, and most didn't. But one of the letters he mailed struck a different tone, and that letter was very well received. That is he. The recipient was Paul Fleshed. Marvin says Paul was one of the few students who never bullied him or said an unkind word. Really touch me. Marvin wrote, There were many days that I wanted to scrack up a conversation with you and that I perceived you as one of the students I could have been friends. Did you get a sense that he was trying to open a door? Absolutely. And when you saw that, what did you think? I thought, well, I'm going to go through that door. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Marvin and Paul became close friends. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> and that friendship eventually led to this. We acknowledge their sacrifice. We celebrate their legacy. Last week, Paul and other leaders in the community hosted a ceremony honoring the Brunswick 15. Those 15 brave children who were once treated like untouchables, now embraced with open arms. It means a lot. It means that we have overcome a lot. Marvin used to say he never had one good day at Brunswick High School, but almost 60 years later, looks like maybe he finally has. Steve Hartman on the road in Lawrenceville, Virginia. Mountain climbers call it the Seven Summits Challenge, reaching the highest peak on all seven continents. CBS's Steve Hartman found a man with a similar goal a bit closer to the ground on the road. Not since early explorers came here to Florida in search of the Fountain of Youth has there been a crazier quest than that of 47-year-old Andrew Carr. The amateur climber and professional French horn player admits he's obsessed. We all have things that grab us, you know, and, and, and I just, I found myself just charmed by this. Andrew is what they call a county high pointer. These are people who try to climb to the highest point of every county in a given state, typically Colorado. Andrew spent some time there doing it. But, but now teaches at the University of South Florida and lives in Tampa, which got him wondering. Good. Could he climb Florida's high points? Unfortunately, Florida makes Kansas look like Kilimanjaro. It's arguably the flattest state in the nation. Doesn't have any high points, really. But if you want to get technical, topographical, and you are truly desperate for adventure, it can be done. And Andrew Carr is doing it. Using maps and apps and good old fashioned sight lines. I feel like we're going up. Andrew pinpoints every peak. This is potentially the Mount Everest of Union County. <laughs> this one was in a well-manicured public place, but other county high points are deep in the woods Lord. or on private property. Yeah, I think that tree over there is it. <laughs> in this case, the home of Debbie Mitchell. Do you think it's at all strange that somebody drove all the way from yes. Tampa to stand in your yard? Okay. <laughs> and this isn't even his most absurd ascent. 
Pinellas County Countryside Mall, front door of J.C. Penney's, I think is a strong contender. You know, so I bought a shirt at that one. <laughs> so. Sir Edmund Hillary, he is not. But Andrew says, so what? And has now hit the high points of almost every one of Florida's 67 counties. On any adventure and also in life in general, you have to make the most of wherever you are. Maybe there's a lot more adventures out there waiting for people than they realize. Absolutely. And every peak is equal. Every peak is equal, he says, because attitude trumps altitude. Whether you're conquering Colorado's front range or just Debbie's front yard. Can I go up here? Yeah, absolutely. Steve Hartman on the road, high above Florida. It's the age-old question of what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, for one New Jersey man, the egg always came first. CBS's Steve Hartman explains on the road. For John Amalfitano, the past is ever present. Everywhere you look in his Donnellan, New Jersey home, there are relics from a bygone era. I don't know what it is with me. I, mean, I just have a, have a connection with old stuff. And he says no connection runs deeper than the curio in this cabinet. That's the oddest thing of all. It's a chicken egg, bequeathed to John by a neighbor who found it in a carton of eggs in 1951. The neighbor saved it because of the note. Whoever gets this egg, please write. Signed, Miss Mary Foss, Forest City, Iowa. John says his neighbor held on to the egg for 50 years and never looked for her. Then John held on to it for another 20 before finally posting pictures on the Weird and Wonderful Secondhand Finds Facebook page. To its three million members, he pondered, wonder if she might still be alive. So all those people who had egg on their Facebook hatched a plan, scrambled, fried hard to find this Mary Foss. After 72 years, they expected an exhausting search that would not be over easy but they cracked the case in less than a day. And for those of you keeping track at home, that was eight puns in 15 seconds. Do you remember writing on that egg? Oh my goodness, yes. And you were hoping to find someone to be a pen pal? Well, who knows? We all dream. Mary is now 92, but as a teenager working in an egg packing plant like this one, Mary says she used to dream of meeting someone in a far off place that fragile little message in a bottle, her way of reaching out. Yes. And now, 72 years later, she has finally made her connection. And here it is. How are you, Egg? <laughs> this week, they came face to face for the first time. And uh, I hope we get to see you again. Would you want to meet John in person? Well, oh, I'd love to meet God, wouldn't you? Oh. <laughs> John. Oh, John. Not really. I have no desire to meet the guy. He's got his problem. He would have that long. Yeah, you're That's saving 70 exactly right. year old eggs. Yeah, you got a point there. Well, when you get to be my age, you meet a lot of kooks. <laughs> Sorry, John. Looks like the yolk's on us. There's my uplifting ending. Steve Hartman on the road in Mason City, Iowa. How do you like your egg? Finally tonight, they say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. CBS's Steve Hartman found one home where it's good for the body and the soul on the road. They come together at the crack of dawn from all directions, converging on this tiny house in St. Louis, Missouri for their weekly Wednesday visit with 66-year-old Peggy Winkowski. It's raining. Grandma Peggy brings everyone together. She's just like a built-in grandma to all of us. She cares for us a lot. She really cares for us. The students who visit Grandma Peggy attend Bishop DeBerg High School and are part of what they call the Wednesday Breakfast Club. Seeing the spread, you can understand why kids might want to come here. But what isn't so clear is how Peggy got roped into hosting. The Wednesday Breakfast Club actually used to meet at this diner. Until one day, a kid named Sam Crow said, you know, my grandma could cook better than this. So the next Wednesday, they showed up at her doorstep. I'm like, okay. And they came all school year every Wednesday. That was back in 2021, and it continued merrily, 
until that day when all joy was lost. About a year and a half ago, Peggy's grandson Sam, a sophomore at Bishop de Burg, was killed in a hit and run. The boy was beloved. So of course, breakfast was the last thing on anyone's mind. And yet, the very next Wednesday, and virtually every Wednesday since during the school year, the kids have returned to Grandma Peggy's in numbers far greater than before. Sam would be so proud, look at what he started. Everyone coming together for a heaping helping of healing. It melts my heart. It's really not about the food. It's just about being together. We benefit from her. She benefits from us. It's like we feed off each other. And we're like keeping his memory alive. So yeah. Good morning, guys. Everyone grieves differently. But those who manage it best always seem to blanket themselves with kindred spirits, sharing the burden teaching each other to laugh again, <laughs> and building tradition to make sure those memories are as snug and sustaining as a warm meal at Grandma's. This is the best morning. Steve Hartman, on the road in St. Louis. Makes Wednesday so much fun. Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to a class getting straight A's in imagination. You may walk to recess. At the Trinity Leadership School near Dallas, Sonia White's first graders are still flying high. Come all the way back and walk. Still reliving their amazing one-day field trip south of the border. Where are you going? Mexico. To Mexico. I love your outfit. It was my first time on a plane. We went inside a cloud. I saw the ocean. Is that your first time seeing the ocean? Mm hmm At this point, you've got to be wondering, how could a school afford this? What kind of teacher does it take to fly a class of first graders to Mexico for a day? A very clever one. So just to be clear, you did not go to Mexico. We did not. You did not get on a plane. We did not. You never left the class. We did not. <laughs> what you're about to see is a testament to the power of imagination and the magic teachers have to harness it. Okay, let's find out. After Sonia's students told her their one wish was to fly on a plane, she went full throttle on the pretend. Your, um, boarding pass and your passport, please. Created travel documents for each child and then boarded them on their flight to Mexico. Okay, guys, we are now at 13,000 feet. You may take out a snack. We had a little turbulence. Boy, it did not scare me. But my friend Lorenzo had a rough landing. Really? What happened to him? He was like... The buy-in really was remarkable. <laughs> One of my students saw somebody that night and they said, what are you doing here? I thought you were in Mexico. And he said, yeah, we were. We got back at three. <laughs> and that's when I was like, they really think we went to Mexico. I'm writing you from Mexico. Teachers Love everywhere could use more resources. But the best always seem to figure out a way to take kids places, often without so much as a bus ride. Did this fuel your desire for more travel? Yes. Do you know North Korea? Yeah, sure. Probably I do not want to go to next. I guess even pretend flights come with travel warnings. Yes. Steve Hartman, on the road, near Dallas. As the nation prepares to honor the brave men and women of our armed forces this Veterans Day, it's important to remember the sacrifice and the legacy every service member leaves behind. CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road to tell the story of one Army sergeant who will live on for generations. Here at Arlington National Cemetery, the final lines of 400,000 life stories are etched on marble, each ending sad to someone. But you can also find uplift in these final chapters, as we learn from the family of Army Sergeant Jack Bryant Jr. Jack, who everyone called Jay, was killed in Iraq almost 20 years ago now. It's important for me to let that legacy live on through my kids. Jennifer Souza of Stafford, Virginia is Jay's sister. Go ahead. And her kids. My name is Jada. Her niece. Jayla. They're all named after Jay. My name is Dieter. In one way or another. My name is Paris. Paris? He visited it two days before he passed. I see. None of the kids knew Jay, 
but they have spent just about every Veterans Day of their lives overcoming that loss. It's like a quiet moment, like we're all together, and it's like, it's nice. It feels like we're right next to him, but uh, he's up. TJ especially has surrounded himself with his uncle's memory. He's got his old comforter, a poster of his favorite musician, and of course, pictures. This is good. Yeah. And every year, copies of those pictures get cut, laminated, and laughed over <laughs> as the family prepares to decorate his grave one more time. So you can give four and Jennifer says it's rituals like this <laughs> that move those memories across the generational divide. There you go. What do you feel when you see them embracing his memory? It's a, it's a sense of just joy. I, I absolutely look forward to celebrating him on Veterans Day. I've never heard of joy associated with Veterans Day, mm -hmm. but you make me feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Spinning pain into pride, a Bryant family tradition. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Arlington, Virginia. Finally tonight, there's nothing like the feeling of young love at any age. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman, On the Road. The Cedar Lake Village Senior Living Center in Olathe, Kansas, isn't exactly known oh, for its single like scene. I, saying, I do like the way they make oatmeal here. Well, Don't I you think it's nice and creamy? But widowers Doris Kirks and Carl Kraus, both 96, found love nonetheless, and just last month became America's oldest newlyweds. It's a relationship that started on cue. Carl was one of the best billiard players in the building until she moved in and started beating the socks off him. Too bad, Carl. Were you surprised that she could shoot as well as she did? Yes, I was definitely surprised. She's a hustler. It's a good feeling to beat men. <laughs> Eventually, rivalry led to romance. Doris and Carl started exploring their shared interests. Carl thought they made beautiful music together and proposed, to which Doris responded, absolutely not. I wasn't looking for a man. <laughs> Ouch. Doris may have been a firm no, but Carl was a stubborn beau. So a couple months later, he asked again. Only this time, he tried a whole different approach. Showed her the larger apartment he had in mind. So up we go to the second floor and went to this room. Uh, oh, this is pretty nice. And then he showed me the walk-in closet. And Doris <laughs> says that sealed the deal. Well, this could work. <laughs> Told him yes right then and there. What's it like to be loved for your walk-in closet? <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. This is it. Of course, Doris says Carl also made more room in his heart. He told me he was dedicated to making this a happy marriage. It warms my heart. Chalk one up for true love. Steve Hartman. Congratulations. On the road in Olathe, Kansas. <laughs> Finally tonight, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road with a story about dreams, resilience, and never taking no for an answer. Although born without hands or feet, 25-year-old Zach Anglin says the only limbs he ever longed for were wings. Always wanted to be a pilot. Unfortunately, no quad amputee had ever become a commercial pilot. Obviously, nothing worth having comes easy. From the time he was born, he was a disciplined and determined child. Adoptive parents Harold and Patty say there was no talking him out of it. So when Zach turned 18, he applied to a flight school that said no. There's nothing we can really do for you. We're sorry. The second one said the same. Like, here we go again. As did the third. The same response. And so it went more than a dozen times over. You're not hearing what they're saying. I'm not. Selective hearing. <laughs> My wife will tell you I'm a little bit hard-headed. <laughs> Which is why this hard-headed husband and soft-hearted father <laughs> applied to one more school. The Spartan College of Aeronautics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They said yes, although Zach's struggle was just getting started. He still needed approval from the Federal Aviation Administration to take the lessons. 
But the FAA repeatedly, and in no uncertain terms, denied his request. And after the fifth rejection letter, Zach finally gave up. I was like, this is not for me. I, this is impossible to do. And so my mom was over my shoulder at this point, right? And then she's like, you're not done yet. I said, you can never succeed until you've learned to fail. And Patty says her son obviously hadn't failed enough. So Zach kept at it until finally they cleared him for one takeoff. And when Zach was given the opportunity to show his potential, it became clear as blue sky that you don't need hands to have wings. Zach graduated from flight school a few years ago and now teaches the same course so many told him he couldn't even take. Why do people need to hear this? Because my story isn't just for amputees. We all go through trials and tribulations. The word impossible is an illusion behind the word possible. And failure, just the turbulence on your journey. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Tulsa. With this season of giving upon us, CBS's Steve Hartman goes on the road for a story about a man who lived a simple life but gave more than anyone could have imagined. Here at Teacher's Treasures, a free store for educators who need school supplies, Executive Director Margaret Sheehan is still stunned at her good fortune. It was an act of amazing kindness. After someone called to offer her nonprofit more than a million dollars. To which I responded, I need to sit down. And it wasn't just her. For the past two years, across the city of Indianapolis, dozens of other nonprofits have gotten the same call. The first thing he said is, what would you do with a million dollars? We hovered above our own bodies, <laughs> thinking like, is this real? The man making the calls was attorney Dwayne Isaacs, and he says just about everyone had that same reaction. Okay. Some wouldn't even hear him out. Probably three or four different entities that lost out because they just didn't take my call. Lost out on a million dollars. Yeah. It was that unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And you still haven't heard the most unbelievable part. The money isn't his. He's just the executor. The money belonged to a guy named Terry Kahn. Terry worked 30 years for the Veterans Administration. He had no immediate family, and most importantly... He just was unbelievably frugal. Terry lived in this modest house in South Indianapolis, drove an old Honda, and refused to carry a cell phone because he said they cost too much. Even when he died back in 2021, he wanted no announcement because who would spend good money on an obituary? The man was Pennywise, but pound generous. Everything was directed to charity, but Terry didn't specify what charity, so Dwayne called around to see who wanted it. And in the end, about a dozen nonprofits took his call and got a share of the $13 million estate. So yeah, it's crazy. Including wow. 1.5 million for teachers' treasures, roughly double their annual budget. Forever changed because of his choice of how he lived. He's smiling someplace, there's no doubt about it. He would be getting a kick out of this. Yes. If only because he just got a glowing obituary <laughs> on CBS News and it didn't cost him a dime. Steve Hartman, on the road in Indianapolis. Holiday season is a time to count our blessings and spread joy to those around us. CBS's Steve Hartman found a group of kids doing that and more on the road. The red caps were the only clue. Yeah. The only hint that something Christmas was afoot. Here we go. Something that would soon strike straight to the heart. Are you guys serious? Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The kids responsible for these moments of overwhelming joy are all students and former students of Derek Brown. Oh, so lights, please. A Phoenix Elementary teacher who uses our on-the-road stories to teach kindness and character. A perennial favorite. Merry Christmas. 
Secret Santa. That wealthy businessman who every year gives out hundreds of hundred dollar bills to random strangers. It's impossible. This is it, impossible. It is possible. It's true. Watching Secret Santa do his thing Crazy. made a huge impression on the kids. I was like shocked because, well, who does that? I've never seen anyone like give, just give money away like that. Could you imagine that someday it would be you? No, not ever. And so, with guidance from Mr. Brown, I sent everybody an itinerary. The kids started a Secret Santa Club and began fundraising, calling friends, family, and businesses. They raised $8,000 without any help from their school or district, just so they could turn around and give it all away. It's okay. To people like Rosemarie Hernandez. Rosemarie had been out of work for a week. You will give me a lot of relief. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys, oh my God. They also gave money to Deidre oh Taylor. Oh my God. Deidre had just gotten diagnosed with cancer and was down to her last $20. You guys are amazing. Gracias. The children spent the day changing dozens of lives. And along the way, they noticed something remarkable, that the more they gave, the more they got. I'm so happy right now. You get so many feelings in your body that just makes you like want to do it again. Their joy, that's the gift to you. Their joy, that's the gift to you. Exactly the realization Mr. Brown was hoping for. I want this memory to be so strong that it now drives them every day in everything they do. Did today change you? Definitely. I never felt this way in my life. So this was really a life changer for me. Whoever said money can't buy happiness, obviously never gave it away. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Phoenix. God bless you too.